and talk about this moon landing because I was actually quite captivated. Maybe this is the inner nerd in me. I was quite <laughs> captivated. Is. Well, maybe it is. Um, this is the moon landing. The US spacecraft successfully landed on the moon. This is the private Odysseus, a lunar lander, successfully touched down on the dusty surface. It was a week-long voyage to get to the moon. What is interesting about this, it's no longer a NASA-controlled operation. Basically, it's a franchise model where NASA has underwritten some of the, uh, the costs of it. They had instruments on that. It is called the IM-1 mission, and the aim of the IM-1 mission was to ensure safe landing technologies worked with NASA instruments measuring speed, distance, and how much fuel was left in their tanks. Now, things didn't quite go to plan, as we will explain now. Joining us now is Andrew Lound, who is a space expert. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. Now, look, you and I spoke before about this, but mm. ju just explain why this mission is important. It's the first time uh, we've been back to the moon uh, yeah. since, when was it, 1972 or thereabouts? Yeah, um, the Americans, yeah. And the Americans. So this, just explain the, the mission and how it was funded and what went wrong. Yeah, the mission it, it itself, um, whereas you've got countries who are visiting the moon at the moment, such as Japan, Russia and India and, and China sending spacecraft, they are state-sponsored uh, expeditions. In the same way Apollo was in, in the 1960s and early 1970s, the Americans have moved a bit further from that now. They're using the state-funded system to, if you do the very major projects, the big projects, the human space flight and things like that, the, the major ones. Um, but missions to the planets uh, for robotic missions, they're trying to use private industry to do it. So a private company will design a lander uh, and the, be launched by a private company, SpaceX, and com countries such as um, the United States who have their agencies such as NASA will actually pay to have payloads placed on a private company's lander uh, and drop it onto the surface. And the idea is to bring the costs of launching and the costs of operating these systems down because a private company can, can move things forward a lot more quicker. We've seen this with SpaceX, really, to be quite honest. They put the costs down and they can actually get rid of all the red tape. And so for the Artemis project, which is a long-term goal of the, of the American government to put people back onto the moon, it's a mixture of government-funded exercises and private industry sort of hiring out their facilities. And the importance about this mission was, this was Intuitive Machines, their attempt to get their lander vehicle onto the surface of the moon. The principle of this mission was to test the, the hardware to get something to touch the surface of the moon. Um, NASA had six experiments on board, six private companies also put experiments on board, universities, people like that to test equipment out uh, as it went down. And the launching was very good. It was a direct launch. That means it, instead of taking loops around the Earth and slowly reach the moon, this was actually going straight towards the moon, which it, which it reached orbit. Um, and then it started, of course, to, to put itself in a position to go down. And then the problem started. The um, onboard laser rangers, which actually beam lasers down to the surface as an altimeter, well, unfortunately, a button which should have been switched wasn't switched, and therefore they weren't working. But by a fluke, NASA themselves, one of their experiments was actually a LIDAR experiment, which they could use as range finders to help guide the vehicle down to the surface which meant that in very short notice, and we're talking about a few hours here, they had to write code for the software so the system could use the NASA experiment to help guide it down to the surface. And that seemed to work, but then it went wrong again. If we have a look at this lunar Ooh. surface here, and this is the lander, you can, can see can the Can you legs. just hold it up a bit more, Andy, sorry. Yeah. There you go, how's that? Yeah. Okay, and as it's coming down, it actually just it drops altitude and it's moving sideways. And one of the legs seems to either caught a rock or the rim of a crater and has tipped it over onto its side. So it's landed actually on its side on the surface of the moon. Fortunately, the main experiments are on the side facing upwards. So they're actually going to be able to get to use all the experiments anyway. So that's been, been a bit fortuitous for us all. But it is the danger when you have a tall vehicle like this, because it is about 
uh, was it eight, 15 to 18 feet tall, that size perhaps of, a, of an old telephone box with legs coming out of it, is that you can actually get it slightly unstable. The early landers, and if you remember the Apollo lunar lander with people in it, it was actually quite a wide-based mm. item which would come down. And that was to, if you like, mitigate the possibility of it tipping over. Um, and what's interesting about this is the second lander that's tipped over, the Japanese lander that landed um, the other week, that's tipped over as well. But that was due to a rocket failure. So we've got this vehicle lying on its side on the moon, but all the experiments are working quite happily. The one experiment which unfortunately it's not really an experiment because it doesn't have any any activity as such is an art experiment but that's actually underneath it so the artwork is still st stood on the surface of the moon mm. and now it's starting to carry out its research but the important of the, some of this research is looking at the dust on the surface of the moon because the dust is, is is electrostatically charged, which can get into everything, equipment and spacesuits. And there's an experiment on board to actually examine that. And one of the NASA experiments was to see how much dust was kicked up from this vehicle to see how it would interact with the vehicle itself. Because obviously, if you've got a base on the moon where people are going to be live and vehicles are coming down and they're firing the, the rocket underneath to slow it down, you're going to get that dust kicking up. You want to see how much damage that can actually cause. So that's one of the most important experiments being done there as well on the surface of the moon. I'm we just saw the the pictures there of uh, of the control team clapping and whooping. Mm. I just thought it was typically American. The statement: the U.S. has returned to the moon today for the first time in the history of humanity. A commercial company, an American company, launched yeah. and led the voyage up there. Today is the day that shows the power and promise of NASA's commercial partnerships. This is really fascinating because my understanding yeah. is also this new business model will yeah. allow faster and faster exploration. I think there's, an yeah. there's another mission planned in the next couple of months. You've got SpaceX yeah. as well. So, so essentially, NASA is helping to balloon the private investment into these missions. It is, and there's a lot of investment to be made. I mean, the technology spin-offs. I mean, for instance, if you're an engineering company and you've developed this system which has dropped something on the moon, the control systems you've got on there, you think, well, wait a minute, how can we apply this electronic equipment now to technologies down here on Earth? I mean, I worked in the rail industry for, for a particular time on, on when we were building the Eurostar. And the Eurostar, for instance, has to transfer power um, from... Uh, overhead to third rail and mm. in that process there's a I think it's a, a three nanosecond transfer of power which would cut the system out that is protected by um, electronic sensors which are actually used on the Ariane space rocket so you can see where you can have technology being brought down and used down here and that's one of the big benefits you get from this of pushing forward technology which can actually benefit us down here especially green tech which is absolutely essential mm. and that's what you need in space and the, by investing in the private sector like this it actually stimulates growth and it actually rotates and moves very, very far forward. Something, for instance, which we, we don't see as, as big, perhaps, in other countries where it's going to be state controlled, which tends to put a bit of an anchor on things a little bit. You need a very mixed thing. You need state and you need the private sector working closely together. And America are now proving this, that this actually works very, very well indeed. Yes, you're going to have failures. This isn't 100% successful. Things tipped over. You have to look at the issues with that. But at the same time, the vehicle is actually working, functioning on the surface. Uh, and the model, I think, is a better model, perhaps, for pushing things forward more quickly. There, there's another really important point to this, which is it landed near the polar south pole. Yes, and, it did. And this is because, and this is where it really captured my imagination, mm. they believe there is frozen water on yes. the surface of the moon. And the reason that's important, if you can then liberate that water, mm. essentially what you've got then is drinking water, which would also change things dramatically. You can then separate the hydrogen and the oxygen atoms. Mm -hmm. That would then give you oxygen that you could breathe. So you've got water now, you've got oxygen, but also could it then be a landing stage to then encourage uh, uh, space travel further into space? That's correct, yes. I mean, this the water thing is really critical because it's it, the thing about water is it's very, very, very heavy. Any engineer tells you it's a real nightmare if you have to carry water with you. So it's it's available on site in, in ice in the craters, and that's really important. So you're right, you split it up into hydrogen and oxygen. You can use the oxygen to breathe. You can use it as an oxidizer with the hydrogen then as fuel. But here's the other thing you can use. You can combine the two together again in a hydrogen fuel cell, and you generate water, heat, and electricity. 
a system that was developed, by the way, by the British for the Apollo program, would you believe? And be, and there was no proper instigation here between public and private sector here to push that technology forward, which was really, really sad. Otherwise, we'd be further along the line. But this is the importance of finding the water, and the Americans will be using it for fuel, for breathing, for drinking water, and, of course, for generating electricity. So you end up with a very efficient system by finding the water. And it's there in the craters in the South Polar region. And although India landed close to the South Polar region, this vehicle is actually closer to the South Pole than the Indian spacecraft. So it's really in the zone where Americans really want to put people down. And perhaps the tipping over of the vehicle is quite useful because it shows you how rugged this terrain is, say, compared to the Sea of Tranquility where Apollo 11 landed, which was a much easier zone to land on. And so if that is the case, and if there is water there, that is the reason it's game-changing, mm. because we haven't been able to do that before. And if you can liberate the water, as you say, then produce fuel and electricity, then then you do reach what I read as a kid, which was Arthur C. Clarke's Islands in the Sky. So then it becomes a staging post. It does, and, and it becomes a staging post for going into the rest of space, because, of course, you don't need the same amount of energy to get you off the moon to go, say, to Mars that you would do from the Earth to get to Mars, so it becomes a much easier place to do. And, of course, once we test all these technologies down here on the moon, where you've got a lot more water ice on Mars than you have on the moon, we believe, it, it, it's the demonstration to how we could survive out there in space. And, of course, if we go even further afield to the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, where we know there's absolutely masses of, of water ice, mm. um, we, get, we test all this technology out here on the moon, close to home, so we can get it all working properly. And that, therefore, becomes the major springboard for exploration in the whole solar system. So I'm very excited about this. I think for children this morning, mm. they will be absolutely stimulated oh, yeah. by the idea that we can explore space. But at the same time, there is a caveat to this, which is the way it could be weaponised by foreign yeah. powers, isn't there? There is. This, this is the nature of humanity, unfortunately. We have to look at the human element on this. And I always, I always go on about this, that if people ever remember it or they can go and find it, there's a film called Moon Zero Two, which, which, which came out in 1969. It's a little bit camp, it's a little bit fun. But the strange thing about it is we've actually reached that point in that film now uh, where you've actually got prospectors going out to the moon, staking their claims. You've got private companies. How do you police all this? We've got two camps actually forming on Earth at the moment. You've got the Americans running in the West, the Artemis Group, mm. and there are the Artemis Accords, which uh, Uruguay have now signed up to, for instance. And this is for the peaceful exploration of the moon and, and space in general, but generally of the moon in this particular case. China haven't signed up to their one. They're doing their own thing with their own allies. So you're going to end up with two camps going out there into space. And you could easily weaponize this, but humans do that. Um, it's unfortunate, it's the nature of who we are. And if you look at the Wild West when it was being explored, I mean, bearing in mind, very much far west of the United States, uh, there wasn't the United States, it was just empty territory and people just raced out of there. There was no policing going on. People were just sort of doing what they wanted to do until somebody clamped down and decided to put it under control. Well, that's the stage we're at here at the moment, we're going out there into the moon. And I think there has to be some international agreements put together. The thing that bothers me with this, we have the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which is way out of date now. And the problem is the way the world is down here on the Earth, and, and, and this is a problem with politicians, unfortunately, um, whose imaginations are a little bit narrower than scientists, very much narrower, they're, gonna, they're not going to be able to get to grips with what needs to be done out there. They're going to be trying to apply Earth-style legislation to people going out into space, and we really need a new thinking when we're going to be, be doing all this. Instead of looking perhaps at nations, we perhaps will be needing to look ourselves as humans going out there into space and what will benefit humankind. But it sounds very fanciful, I know, but a lot of us actually do believe that. Why we actually went into this game in the first place was to, some, to, to push the future of our species rather than to hold it back. But I think human nature will, will take over and nation states will say, well, wait a minute, we've gone to this part of the moon, we're claiming this part of the moon. Well, well sure, we but also at the same time, the International Space Station is nearing the end of its life, isn't it? And that was yeah. an international effort. And, and this should be about collective responsibility. I think that's a yes. really wonderful thought and idea. I hope it's practicable. It is. International space. Interestingly, with the International Space Station, even with the crisis with Russia and Ukraine, Russians are on board the International Space Station and they're still cooperating with 
the Americans and other other businesses in the space station, whether whether they be French, German, or whatever. And that's interesting. Whereas on the space station, it's there's still cooperation, and the Americans and Russians in the scientific terms in space are still talking to each other that perhaps gives us a bit of hope for the future that it can be done properly i mean even in the height of the cold war american scientists and engineers were still talking to their soviet counterparts albeit sometimes quietly because they saw a bigger picture than what the politicians could see yeah, ama amazing, Andy. Thank you so much. Really good to talk to you as well. Thank you. So, so well informed, Andrew Lamb, there, uh, who is a space <laughs> expert.